Simon Napier Bell. Big round of applause, please. And it's funny, you know, you, I look at that film and none of us, we get older, we don't, we don't feel older inside. I mean, you walk in the bathroom every day and look in the mirror and say, well, who's that old geezer in the mirror? And, but I, I see my, I meet my friends and they look at all, all look older. Like poor chaps, they're not doing so well. But inside myself, you know, I'm sure all you feel the same. You, you feel like the same sort of 25 year old rock manager dancing around the clubs like that. You know, there was about um, 10 years ago, my last book came out. I've been pretty lazy, it's been a long time between books. Um, and I had a tour of America, a speaking tour. Not a big one, about seven or eight dates. And uh, the agent fixed me up, came around University Rock Appreciation Societies. And the first night I arrived, uh, I arrived in uh, Boston. And I was met by this little old lady, Lisa Birkenstein. Oh, she was about five foot one and she had purple rinsed hair and very petite and nice bones. Old, I mean, she really, in fact, she reminded my grandmother. And I, I, in my mind, I was calling her granny. I tried not, tried not to say that to her. And she led me to her car, it was a big Buick, and she had the yellow pages on the driver's seat and the cushion on top so she, she could steer the steering wheel while she was steering. And um, I just thought, well, you know, she'd been driving, been driving a little bit, and she said, oh, uh, I remember in the 1960s when you brought the Yardbirds to America and you were at the Chicago Hilton. And I was thinking, but she's so old, why would she remember that? Oh, perhaps she had a daughter who was a rock fan. And then suddenly she said to me, I went to the Hilton and I met all the Yardbirds. They were, they were such beautiful boys. And you know what? I sucked their little dickies. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the moment I realised that when I was a 25-year-old manager, she was a 15-year-old groupie. I mean, this woman I was calling Granny was... I mean, I, I, mean, I was older than her. I, in fact, I pulled the sun visor down in the car and looked in the mirror and then looked across at her driving. Jesus. <laughs> The next, the next day was, was just as bad. In fact, there was a chain of them. Every one of the, these are groupie grannies, and they ran this rock appreciation chain all across America. And uh, I was shuffled from one to another. The next night I arrived, and uh, I hadn't been in the car five minutes, and this almost similar that old lady said, she said, oh, my husband died five years ago, and I haven't had, haven't had Nookie for six months. She said, are you up for it? And I said, for sake, you know I'm gay. And she said, Oh, sure, at your age, you're over that, aren't you? <laughs> That's like a war zone. Um, but anyway, thank goodness, when I went to these talks, uh, it wasn't little old ladies coming to the talks. It was mainly students, uh, very earnest, 20, 25-year-old students, who knew more about rock music than I did. I mean, I may know about the business. They knew about every artist and recording and where they were done and when they were recorded and who sang the solos. Very intense people. But after the, um, after the talk every night, the one thing everybody asks is, how did you get in the business? How would we get in the business? How could we become a manager? And I felt really quite guilty that I, I didn't have a good answer because I was somebody, when I was very young, 10, 12, 15 at school, when I left school, and even up to 25, I, really, I didn't really have an objective. I, didn't, I just like I just like sort of wandering around the world and watching things go by and making the best of things. I still do. I didn't have a, an ambition. I wasn't hugely motivated. And, um, and what motivated me actually was when I came across pop and rock groups. And these kids have tremendous motivation. They definitely know what they want. They know where they're going. Um, and that really dovetailed with my ability to just look objectively and say, well, you should do this and do that. So uh, it became a good partnership between sort of my quick wittedness and not grabbing opportunities and there. Uh, and their motivation. But the actual time, the actual thing which got me into the uh, record business or music industry was that car you just saw. I'd been working in the film industry as an assistant editor and um, at the end of a rather good run of good films I suddenly found I had £10,000 in my bank account. And I've got to tell you in 1960 £10,000 is like 150 or 200. I could have bought a house in Kensington but I decided I'd waste it and I went and bought a car. Not even a sensible car, I got a brand new Rolls Royce was £9,000 and I went and bought this sort of second-hand ridiculous boat uh, from America uh, and it was a magnificent car, I mean, uh, when if you pressed the button, the boot went up and then the hood went up and then the hood folded into the boot and the boot went down again and it was, you left this huge open convertible, it looked like, more like something which should, should be in a marina than the, than the street. And I drove one night to Trendy uh, Disco at the moment, which was the Ad Lib Club. The Ad Lib Club was in, in Leicester Square. And the night I arrived in that car, as I was coming in downstairs, an aspiring pop group saw me. 
And you know, they presumed I was a pop manager. Who else would waste so much money on a piece of silly junk like that? And a bit later, when I was sitting, you know, nodding to the music, pretty drunk about one in the morning, um, and drinking a cocktail, they came across. And uh, they asked me would I manage them. And uh, I just, just went on nodding to them. I couldn't hear a word, you never can, can you? And, um, and the next day they turned up where I was working in the cutting rooms and told me I was their manager. And uh, that was a pretty good way to get the music. And so I said yes. Um, and that led to another group, which I actually got a, a number five record with. And then the next thing I knew, the, the Yardbirds had called me up and said, would you, would you like to be our manager? So I grabbed the opportunity. I knew nothing about the music business at all, but I was always an opportunity grabber. And when I started writing this book, um, Tararabundiye, went back to the beginning of the music industry, three year, 300 years ago, and I started reading and researching, I found that nearly every single one of the, the major characters in the business, the people we all remember now and revere and say these were the, the great people who built the business, none of them were serious business people who sat down and planned how to make, make money in the music business or, or help the music business. None of them were, were benevolent or... They were, they were all opportunists having fun. They, they love music and they love musicians and they love fun life. They, they like drinking and eating and having sex and drugs. And the, the, I didn't find a single one of the people who'd been major in the music business were anything but that type of opportunist. And I have to admit that, that my path to the music business was very, very similar. It was always, somehow I had the, the luck to see opportunities, like when the Yardbirds called me, said, can I be their manager? Uh, I knew nothing about management. I didn't even know about rock music. I mean, I'd loved jazz and I'd played jazz as a musician, but um, I really knew nothing about rock. And, and almost at the beginning, we, were doing, we did a trip to Paris to play in a club, and um, the bass player, Paul Samuel Smith, took me aside and said, you know, I really hate, I hate live music. I hate going out and playing live. I, I really, it's the thing I dislike most is having to be on the road with the others. And I didn't understand that probably the manager, a group's manager's number one job is to keep a group together. If you keep a group together long enough, they'll have success. And they, you just hold them together somehow, and I knew nothing about that. So I said, oh, you poor chap, you're not enjoying yourself, that's terrible, you should leave and we'll get someone else in. Stupid, naive thing to say. But, but he left. And then I was stuck with the Yardbirds without a bass player. And then when I talked around, I talked to Jeff Beck, who was the guitarist of the group, and everybody said, well, it'd be fantastic if Jimmy Page had come in the group. And I knew Jimmy because I'd been uh, writing songs and having, doing sessions for the last two years. And Jimmy was basically just a session guitarist. So I asked if he'd come in the group, and he came in the group. So we now had these two fantastic guitarists, Britain's best two rock guitarists, perhaps the world's best two rock guitarists, Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck playing on each side of the stage as all Jeff Beck's solos and stereo. It was, a, it was a fantastic thing to pull off, and it was, it was really sheer luck, sheer opportunism in the game. And then the next thing which happened was I was having dinner one night with my very good friend Kit Lambert, who managed The Who. And um, Kit was a real film buff. He'd been brought up in films. And um, he was thrilled because he'd heard that Antonioni, the famous Italian director, was in town and had come to London to make a film about Swinging London and wanted The Who to play a, a, a part in the film because he'd heard about them smashing their instruments up and it seemed to Antonioni to, to suit the nihilistic London. Um, and Kit was going to see him the next day at the Savoy Hotel. Well, I was jealous. I was also brought up in the film industry. My dad was a film director. I'd seen all of Antonioni films when I was 10 or 11. And I was jealous, simple and gentle that. So I said to Kit, you know, who are the best there is? You, you really mustn't let them go cheap. You ask for 10,000 pounds minimum, absolute minimum. And you've got to tell Antonioni, you get editing control. I mean, the section where they're in the film, you get editing control. And Kit was all fired up, so I will, I will, and did and was thrown out in his ear in about five minutes. Uh, whereupon I phoned Antonio, and he was very smarmy and nice, and said I had probably the biggest group in the world, uh, uh, but above the Who, definitely, only the Beatles and the Stones were above the Yardbirds. Could I come and see him? And um, he explained about the smashing real quickly. I said, well, that's what we do every night. We smash all our, the Who just copied us. And, um, and we love your films. Everyone in the group knows your films. They love them, and we'd love to do them. And, um, you know, and we leave it all to you because we know you, you just do it beautifully. And, and uh, he asked about a fee, and I said, oh, fees, no, this is art. You, know, you just do what you want. And so we got the part. So uh, the Yardbirds appearing in, in, in Blow Up, it was, it was a huge thing, and it really pushed their imagery and their, their name everywhere. 
another bit of opportunist luck. And, uh, but it also had a big downside, because when we went to Elstree Theatres to film it, um, Antonio only wanted the smashing up of stuff, and Jeff wouldn't smash his guitar. He just simply wouldn't, nor would Jimmy. They loved their guitars. Jeff used to put his guitar to, uh, to bed at night. He'd sing it, sing it a lullaby and, and polish it to sleep. And um, in, in the end, we got a compromise. We bought some second-hand guitars, and he would push them through the lamp. So he'd smash an amp. And he did it, and it was very good. And he did it very well. And Antonioni, Antonioni loved it. But so did Jeff. And when we got to America on the tour we were about to do, um, the tour came up at the beginning of my talk, where I, the old ladies, um, now old ladies, the groupie grannies, went to it. Um, Jeff decided he'd like to go on doing this Antonioni's amp smashing trick. And the first night he smashed his guitar through the amp and then walked off stage and he didn't have an amp to play with. And then I was called into the dressing room afterwards to get another amp for the next night. Well, these were Marshall amps, and in the whole of America, there were only seven Marshall amps at the time. And I phoned around America, I found one in Miami, we had it flown up for the next gig, and Jeff, within five minutes, did exactly the same thing. And after seven nights, we'd run out of Marshall amps, and Jeff left the group. So that was the downside of it. <laughs> so, you know, this is what you put up with as a, as a manager. But if you grab your opportunities and do well, um, you really can uh, make people think you're a genius at your work and let you come and talk to them in pubs like this. Um, but I'll give you a little opportunity, a uh, list of opportunities saga, which was when I uh, was managing Wham in the 80s. When I started managing Wham, um, I went out to did jazz, I had a partner, jazz songs, there were two of us managing them. And we got hold of them, they agreed we could manage them, we went out to dinner the very first night, it's the Bombay Brasserie in South Kensington. And George fixed us with a steely eye and said, we want to be the biggest group in the world and you've got a year. Well, that's ridiculous. The biggest group in the world has to be the biggest group in America also. And no one has ever broken in America in a year. It takes at least two or three or four years. This was the days before the internet too. There was no shortcut at all. You had to go to America and tour and then tour in a bigger venue and a bigger venue. It took four years probably. And he said, one year, he said, and we don't want to do photographs, I don't like photographs, and I don't want to talk to radio producers and meet their wives, I'm just sorted out. And um, over the course of the next two or three bottles of wine, one of us, I think it was Jazz, not me, said maybe we could make you the, the first Western pop group ever to play in China. So George said, that's great, fix it. A completely impossible, stupid, drunk idea which came over dinner. Uh, and three days later, I find myself in Beijing with a visa I've managed to bri buy by bribing somebody uh, in a shop in Hong Kong, uh, in a hotel with absolutely no idea at all what I was meant to do or how it could be done. And I talked to a few people on the reception and I found that if I called the British Embassy, they would give me a book which listed all the uh, different ministries of the Chinese government. And I, so I started at the top of the book, and I decided I'd phone each and every one and say, could you tell the minister, Simon Nicobell has come from London to take him to lunch. And the point was that they wouldn't know who I was. And I figured if I went back every month, they would soon, and, I was, and phone them all again, they'd soon get the idea that I really wasn't there just, just for them. They'd think, oh, he must be important because he's coming every month and he wants to buy me lunch, but it's not just me and I've got a taker. In fact, my first taker was the second time I went back. And um, this charming chap turned up. He was Minister of Energy. I don't really know why he'd come to see me. He, he turned up on his bicycle, and as Chairman Mao, one you know, of the old dungaree suit, um, and he had bicycle clips on, which he pulled off in the lobby of the hotel, and said, uh, oh, very pleased to meet you. Very pleased to talk about buying coal. He got me muggled up with someone from Norway, I think. But um, I, you know, I didn't want to be churlish. You know, he'd come to lunch, and I'd buy him lunch. So I took him to lunch. He spoke quite good English. In fact, of all the ministers I ever talked to, he was the one who spoke best English. And um, I told him my plan. I said, I want to talk to people about maybe one day a Western pop group coming and playing in China. And I just thought the best thing was to, to, just to invite people to lunch. And he said, it's a fantastic idea because the food in Beijing is terrible. The only good food is in this hotel where you're staying because it's Western run. And we're not allowed to eat in it because you have to play in dollars and we're not allowed to have dollars and we go to jail and we found them. So if you invite ministers to lunch bit by bit, they'll all come. So that was good news, and I phoned a few more, and the next month I turned up, and he came again, and this time with his translator, uh, two translators, one was the, actually his girlfriend probably, or his wife, 
But anyway, uh, he brought me three more ministers and two translators, and we had seven people. And I went every single month. And after 11 months, I had maybe 20 people I was buying lunch for. And the way I tackled this whole thing was never ask the question which they could say yes or no. And I just said at the first of these lunches, you know, um, there's very good music in London. It would be wonderful if, wonderful if one day some of Western pop music could be played in China. And then the next month I'd say, you know, I manage a group in London. And if, if, if one day Western pop music did come and play in China, it would be wonderful if it was Wan. And then the next time I would go on and on bit by bit. And after 13 months, I, I finally said, I, I suggested everything up to the, the last little hint thing. And I said, you know, it'd be wonderful if, if Wan did come play in China one day, but if it was in March, March 13th, something like that. Um, and it, it, that was the lunch where one of the translators said to me, uh, the Minister of Culture wants to talk to you. Minister of Culture? I, he'd never come to a lunch. This is quite a higher person. In, in China, culture is put right up in the top four. I mean, apart from the Minister of War and probably the Minister of Culture, they're, they're probably the top ones. And so uh, he said, come back in two weeks and we'll meet the Minister of Culture. So I came back to England very excited because I felt I'd got there. I'd, I'd actually said we wanted Wan to play in March on the 13th. I'd even said I thought it would work at Stadium would be a nice place for him to play. I'd, I'd put the whole thing to them. I hadn't said the yes or no question, and now I was going to meet the Minister of Culture. So I was very tensed up. And four days before I was due to leave, I got the most astonishing earache. It was simply the worst pain I've ever had in my life. An acute, incredible pain. And it literally grew worse by the minute. It started in the night, and by the time it got to nine o'clock, I rushed to the doctor, who peered down my ear and said, you've got a, a tiny, 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 tiny little thing growing there, which he thought was a fungus of some sort, which I'd picked up swimming in some remote sea somewhere. Um, and I told him, I've got to go to China. What do I do? He said, oh, no, the only way to get rid of this, you have to come every day, and we give you, uh, we, do it, we burn it out with acid. It's the only way to get rid of these things. And you need to come twice a day. It'll be about three weeks doing it. Very, very low acid, but just slowly burn it away. I can't. I've got to be in China on Friday. And I can't live with this pain. It was just, even sitting there with him, it was just unbelievable. Like a huge egg blowing up away. And he said, well, we can kill the pain. That's not a problem. If we can make it airtight. Fungus can't expand without air. And the way you do it is they put a special bandaging. And he sent me round to Harley Street, where there was a, an air note and, and throat specialist who sent me down to the nurse and they put the air bandage in. Now this, the bandage they use is extraordinary. It's actually uh, quite like cotton, the sort of thing you sew a button on, but fine, very, very fine and ordinary cotton. And he had a, he had a little, little cardboard sachet with a cotton wrapped around. It's about six yards of it. And she took tweezers and she pushed, little bit, little, centimetre at a time, little by little, so it packed it, packed it, packed it down. And this is the only way to make it utterly airtight. And when she got this entire six hours of cotton packed in and put it down, they put a dressing on top, and it, it, the pain just went, just instant, it's a miracle, just like that. So I set off for, for Beijing, and the last thing she said is, you just, just don't get your head wet when you have a shower, just, you know, just cover your ears or, or don't have your hair, wash your hair. And I went to Beijing and arrived in the Chips Hotel, and the next morning I had the appointment with the Minister of Culture, and my, the translator came to pick me up, and we were down the limo and we went up to the thing and it, and it started pouring with rain and there was a traffic jam as a result. And when we got to where the ministry was, we were going on this side of the road, the ministry is that side of the road, and to get there the car would have to go up about another half kilometre and come back round a U-turn. But it was already time, it was three o'clock, we were meant to be there and pouring with rain and the, and the driver, the translator talk, they said, well just run across the road, it'd be much quicker, you'd be there in two minutes. So he stopped the car and he had a nice umbrella in the boot. He got the umbrella out and he put it up and the translator held the umbrella over us. And we ran across the road, but you know, no umbrella's really big enough for two people, not a big one like this. And, um, and as we ran across the road, water was coming down over my neck and it was a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but it was all right, we got there. I wasn't soaking wet, so that was fine. But um, it had gone over my ear. And um, so we went up to the minister and as we were going up in the lift, my ear started throbbing again. And by the time we got to the top, it was throbbing worse than it ever was when I got to the doctor in the first place. And by the time we were shown into the room where the minister was, I, I was literally just I screaming with pain. I, I just, the pain was unbelievable. It was as if somebody, just a, there was a bison in there having a fight. And, and I 
it didn't matter. It didn't matter that the minister was sitting there waiting to greet me, and he put his hand up. So I just didn't care, and I just grabbed it around. And I managed to get an end of this cotton, and I pulled it. But it got wet. It had got soaking wet, and what had gone in was this tiny thin little cotton came out like a good-sized spaghetti. And I pulled 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 and eventually there was six yards of fettuccine on the floor. And suddenly the minister jumped up and started applauding. Hooray, 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 hooray. <laughs> and it turned out he was an amateur conjurer. <laughs> yes. And two weeks later, Wan were invited to China. <laughs> Okay. Simon, congratulations, firstly, on the book, ta ra ra bum Dieng, great title, by the way. But uh, the book, uh, Simon, it's a definitive history of the business of popular music. Were you surprised by some of the things you discovered during uh, your research here? One is, I mentioned already, that, that all the key people, all the really important people, the people we remember as a business people I'm talking about, who, further the industry, move it forward, nearly without fail, were um, dilettante, opportunist, self-seeking, hedonist people. And that, I, I like that because I always feel incredibly uncomfortable when someone says to me, oh, Simon, you're a legend, you're great, and I just think, come on, all I've ever done is just enjoy myself and get drunk and have sex and travel around the world. And so suddenly I found that's what you're meant to do if you're going to be a huge figure in the business. So I'd done the right thing. I felt good about that. You wear many hats in the introduction. You know, I described, you know, producer, songwriter, manager, and on and on and on, author, rapporteur. If, if you had to describe yourself and what you do... It's not always... It's, 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 in, in, the, in, the, in the promotion of a good career and a good image, it's not always the best thing to tell the truth. No. <laughs> Uh, so if I just said I'm, I'm very good at taking opportunities, it sounds better than saying just an opportunist. But it is the case. I mean, I, I, I'm aware that I'm, you know, I'm quick-witted, I'm bright, I have a very good ear for, for something which might be commercial, might take other people's fancy. Yeah. Um, but that's really what I do. And I, I don't give any credit to myself as being a real producer or a real songwriter. I've just had moments when I've had some luck with them. Yeah. Uh, did you think the Kickstarter campaign was going to go as well as it did? It wasn't Kickstarter, it was Unbound, Unbound Books. Sorry. Unbound Books, is, it's interesting because the, the concept of um, what they're really doing is not like Kickstarter where you raise money and however much you raise you keep. Unbound Books simply sell books in advance and when the money from the selling the books in advance is taken in, they then have the money to, to print and do the copy editing and everything which has to be done. And it's not really new. I mean, in the 18th and 19th century, most of the most famous authors did this, and it was called subscription publishing. And it was selling your books in advance to get the money to publish them. And one of the reasons I thought I should do it was because, I, as I explained, I still do have a company which manages artists. And I often tell them, I think, crowdfunding is a good idea. So I thought, well, I'll try it. But I sort of didn't enjoy it. And I, I, I mean, I'm a hard old rock manager. I don't care, and I can push. But I thought what you're going to get if you do this is that if artists do this, a lot of artists will be capable of it. You're going to get an artist who's, who is tough and pushy, but not necessarily sensitive. What was the um, happiest part of your management career? You know, uh, it's an extraordinary thing, however much I enjoy managing artists. It's always a very happy day when it finishes, because then you're free again. You know, when you manage an artist, however well it goes, it is, it's 24-7, it's all night, they call you at 4 in the morning. I've had an artist call up. From, you know, from Australia at three in the morning and saying, sign and I haven't got any clean socks to go and stay with. I mean, it can drive you mad. Um, are there any bands or artists you wish you would have managed you regret not When Wham were making the video for Careless Whisper, we went to Miami to make it, and they were already a very, very big group. And every newspaper and, well, every newspaper wanted to send a journalist, and we only allowed five journalists to go, because it gets out of control. And one of the journalists we allowed to go was from the enemy, and they're there. Uh, it's a favour. We let them come. They mix the group, but you know they're there as journalists. And on the second night I was there, the journalist from the enemy came across me, gave me a tape, and said, "Would you listen to my tape?" And I was very annoyed with him. I said, "You know, you're here as a journalist. You're not here to get access to me." And I slung his tape away and said, "So fuck off." And it was Neil Tennant, and the tape, the tape was the Pet Shop Boys' first album. 
and they became one of my favourite groups, and I, of course I didn't manage them. Fantastic. Your favourite band you managed? Your favourite band um, you managed? Well, the favourite band, I think, was Japan. Uh, and, and it took me, it took six years to break them, and uh, I don't think there's anything that could be different. It was extraordinarily difficult to break, it was a long, slow process, and, um, and we were really friends. And there was one moment in the fourth year when I had I put all my own money into them. I, I put nearly 400,000 pounds into them. And this is, it's a lot of money then, much more than that silly car I bought. Uh, there was one day and I just thought, a good businessman sticks at what he's doing, but there's a moment when a good businessman says, no, this is not a good idea, let's stop. And um, so I called them and I said, you know, you must come to the office tomorrow. And I stayed up all night thinking about how I was going to explain to them. We just, I had to give up. And they all arrived, all dressed nicely and all clean and looking lovely and said, yes, Simon, what's this meeting all about? And, and I said, we've got to work out how to make this work. <laughs> Any more questions? I'm sure somebody else has it. Yes. When you managed to get Jimmy Page the Yardbirds gig, mm -hmm. were you not in? How did Peter Grant come into it? Once, once Jeff left the group, and, and, and there was only Jimmy as a guitarist. I, Jimmy and I didn't get on very well. We didn't fight actually. In fact, we didn't even have animosity. It was just we, we just had different different objectives. My objective was. I mean, I've told you, it was really, I just enjoy life and I like, enjoyed managing the group and, and was prepared to let it go along as it was. Jimmy had a very specific objective he was wanted to take. Was it an artistic take. goal? Yes, it was an artistic oh, goal. Okay, now fine. sometimes that works well with a manager because usually I can help someone, but his artistic goal didn't seem to me in tune with the other members of the, of the Yardbirds. And my job was to manage the Yardbirds. When you manage a group it's difficult, you do manage five people or four people equally, you've got to look at that. And I just felt that um, it was difficult for me to, to help Jimmy reach his goal without doing the wrong thing by the others and vice versa. Um, and so I said, well, look, I'll just take you some. I'm fed up with it. And I actually, first it wasn't, it was the production I was fed up. I was also producing the group. And I decided I didn't want to produce the records anymore. And I took them to Mickey Most, who had the animals at the time. And he seemed, he, he seems a very unsuitable producer now. But at the time, that didn't seem so. The animals were the same sort of level of rather blues influence group. Um, and he took them on, and uh, Peter Grant was his partner. And he said, well, would you like me to manage them? And I thought, that, that'd be lovely. And I'll go off and do, sit on the beach. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Peter, Grant, that one. Peter Grant was a very good manager, if you look at it only in terms of our business and doing well for the group. But he, he, you know, he, he pushed up the amount of money the group got from live work and he always worked for them and, and everything he did was for the group. But what he did in doing that was often very un, very unpleasant. I and mean, he was a murderous thug and he did smash what, people up. You know, if you read Phil, Bill Graham's book, I mean, there are some most detailed accounts of really unbelievably disgusting behaviour. And it does amaze me that the Music Managers Forum in the UK presents every year the Peter Grant Award, which is really like you know, producing and presenting the Al Capone Award for the best Italian restaurant. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Keith Moon in the brothel, and it had something to do with you. And there were two. There were, and there were two. Different, there were two different stories about Keith Moon in brothel. Well, tell us one. <laughs> well, I was in the brothel. That's yeah. the point. Exactly. <laughs> in Mombasa. Well, it wasn't a brothel. It was just. It just. I went back with somebody, and I ended up in this rather dubious uh, building where there were lots of little flats with a very dubious person. <laughs> Um, who uh, it, I didn't turn out to be giving me quite what I thought I was going to get for, for the money I thought I was going to get charged. And then when I tried to leave, um, she shouted and a man came with a big knife. This is in Mombasa. And uh, put it under my throat and told me I had to find lots of money. And um, while I was just wondering what to do, the door of another uh, apartment or room burst open and Keith Moon jumped out. With, with his trousers half undone, zipping away his belongings, saw what was going on, and slammed the man in the face, and we both ran away. Okay, well, thank you very much. I have a question. Oh, um, so I'm finished. Simon, so if I had a sort of time machine outside, sort of TARDIS thingy, mm -hmm. and after this event, I could take you back to any particular time in your career, 
Where would you go and why? It's, it's going to be sex and drugs and drinking, <laughs> da dancing and having fun. You know, it's not going to be any, anything very honourable or sensible. I was just hoping for a really juicy story. You, you buy the books, they're all in there. Okay, th thank you very much. <laughs>